split in French. Brother, first I want to say, uh, Keith Thompson would say, I'm so proud of you in a good way. <laughs> and, <laughs> I am so proud of you in a good way. Uh, this was absolutely exceptional. And I never cease to be amazed with your self-education on this material. I'm so thankful for all you've put into it and you did an outstanding job. I have two questions. Uh, in Peter Flint and Martin Abegg's Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, I think you're probably familiar with that book and with those men. It was in my library and you cataloged it. So. <laughs> <laughs> in that, in that uh, book, they include Jubilees, but not Enoch. They don't include First Enoch as biblical literature, but they do include Jubilees and they put it in the Torah and I always wondered why. You basically may have explained that by saying that it retells the patriarchal history. But could you uh, give us a reason we could give to someone who might bring that up, that they include it in the Bible and in the Torah? Uh, give us a reason for why we would reject that kind of, a, of an inclusion. Well, the, the first reason I would give would have to do with the contradictions, contradictions between the Book of Jubilees and the Torah itself. Uh, th this assertion that the patriarchs kept the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament is, is not supported at all in the biblical literature itself. I would also look at the, the fringe nature of the sect at Qumran, and as I understand it, this book is designed to, to illustrate the Bible that this sect used. And it seems that they did, they did read Jubilees as an authoritative book, but they had a, a politically and ideologically motivated reason to do so. It's because this book supported the, the points of contention that they held against the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily object to those scholars' inclusion of that, that book in the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, if we're talking about that community, because they did read it as part of their Bible. But that, that does not mean that we should read it today as part of our Bible because we don't agree with the, uh, the ideological basis that that sect was founded on. Very good. Uh, in the 39 articles of the Anglican Church, they say this about the Apocrypha. The church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, but yet it doth not apply them to establish any doctrine. Of course, for many years until relatively recently, that was true of most people who said that they were Christians, even in the Restoration Movement. Uh, do you remember which Esdras Campbell quotes from in the masthead of the Millennial Harbinger? Is it first or second? I think that one might be fourth, but <laughs> I could be wrong. <laughs> well, of course, he quotes from one of them, and that many people may not realize that, but Alexander Campbell and the other men were well-read in this literature. Most Christians throughout history up into the 1800s were. Now, I would think not all of these books would be valuable, necessarily, even for what the articles say, example of life and instruction of manners. And of course, we live in a world where it's hard to get Christians to read inspired scripture. <laughs> and that's frustrating. And, but what would you say to people? Is there value for instruction of life or in, instruction of manner, an example of life, or however they said that, in reading some of these books? And uh, which books would be more valuable than others? How would you navigate the ones that might really contribute to our understanding of scripture or our spiritual formation, if any? Now, I have to admit in this that most of my research for this presentation has been secondary research, so I have not spent as much time in the books themselves, simply because of the, the vast number of them. I had to build a framework first before I could deal with them directly. I did mention in the presentation that I think some of these books were not written to try to be scripture. And uh, the, the books of Tobit, Ecclesiasticus, and Judith come to mind. These were written to be either stories or commentaries on scripture, which uh, 
as I mentioned, we, we read a lot of these kinds of books today. Whenever we read a sermon book, we might read about stories, made up stories of a, a figure who's working their way through a difficult situation to give us an example of how to solve a similar situation. So we might find some value from these books on that level. Now, there, there are some, uh, uh, some theological issues with some of these books. I, I wouldn't theologically agree with the author of the book of Tobit, for example. There's quite a few very strange things that we might find in, in, that, <laughs> uh, in that story. But some of them might be more helpful, like Ecclesiasticus, to help us understand how someone who took Judaism seriously read the, the scriptures and applied them. And if we read it knowing that we might well disagree with some of the conclusions he, he reaches, we might find some benefit from that, that literature. Others, the, the, one, the, the literature that claims uh, divine inspiration might be much less helpful for us today because uh, it's, it, we can't even take the, the most fundamental uh, uh, agreement or, or start, start on a, a foundation of agreement with that literature. But the ones that weren't intended to be read as divinely inspired might be more helpful in that way. Alan Bonifay, Glenn Osberg, and David Griffin. Enjoyed it very much, Matt. Uh, I appreciate the information. I wonder, in your research and study of this, how much do you think the Second Temple literature, or did any of it, affect uh, the writing of the apostles the New Testament, uh, did they rely on that as history? Did they, do they allude to it? Now, it's difficult in uh, the case of historical events, like some of the martyrs mentioned in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, for example, that uh, a lot of scholars refer that back to the book of Second Maccabees. Um, it's difficult to tell if the New Testament authors are referring to the history as written in the intertestamental literature, or if they have an independent knowledge of the same events. I would say that there are some indications that the New Testament authors were aware of this literature, but it did not guide their theological uh, conclusions to, to any, any significant or any measurable degree. Uh, the, the theological conclusions they reach from the Old Testament come from the Old Testament itself, not from the uh, Second Temple Period interpreters. First of all, that was an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, one other thing that I think that we should note um, is some of the reason why the contemporary interest in some of these writings exists is because they're trying to attack the authority of Scripture and those, you know, find out which ones are inspired and not. With that in mind, <laughs> I want to. You and I were talking before you gave your thing. And in Jude, uh, he mentions in Jude, he says, uh, 14, and it was about these men that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all 15. And then he ends, you know, these grumblers finding fault. He seems to quote it and say that it's inspired. Uh, what are your thoughts on that if, if, if you... <laughs> no, no, and this is a, a notoriously difficult question that comes up in a, in a lot of uh, contexts um, that there are several directions I could go one is that the, the, the history of the book of first Enoch which which is what uh, Jude may be quoting there um, is is uncertain there's a section of the book that may not have been written until after the New Testament, and that quote comes from that section. So there's some possibility that there's uh, more mutual dependence on, on some other source between Jude and, and First Enoch. But even if he is quoting from it, we have examples of Paul making appeals to Greek poets to make a spiritual point in uh, Acts 17, for example, and he, he makes a spiritual case basically from, from this Greek poet, but he does not extend inspiration to that, that poet. The, the quote is, in him we move, in him we live and we move and have our being, if I remember right. Uh, and so, so it's possible that, that Jude is making the same kind of an appeal 
to a, a tradition that's known by his authors. And he's not necessarily extending divine authority to that whole work, but he's referring back to a quote that is well known to make a, a spiritual point in the same way that Paul was with the Greek poets. Well, Matthew, I'd like to echo everything that's been said. I, that's really a good job, excellent job that you did there. Uh, uh, Clint kind of stole my question, so I guess I'll, I'll come up with another one here. Uh, uh, several years ago, I don't know how long, decades maybe, there was a book published called The Lost Books of the Bible that contained some of this literature, and uh, which that's kind of a, a misnomer because, of course, most of this literature, to my knowledge, has never actually been lost, and number two, it's probably not part of the Bible, as we've already pretty well agreed. But uh, book publishers like to uh, use a sensational title to sell books. Otherwise, nobody would buy this material, or generally the public would not. But anyway, uh, so I have a question about a couple of things that are in that uh, lost books of the Bible. Uh, since you were going down the list of literature, I was looking forward to hearing the other items in, in the list. And so you mentioned at the beginning, I'll just pick one. You mentioned at the be beginning in your uh, listing out there, uh, the, the books of Adam and Eve, I think that's the title, or the uh, Adam and Eve, their names were in the titles, I think that's what it was. Could you just plug those into a time frame and kind of tell us where they fit in in the scheme of things? And that, that is unfortunately one of the books that I, I uh, didn't get to in, in my own research, so I, I'm, I'm uh, going to say I, I'm not prepared to answer that question. <laughs> One final question uh, with Clint French. I just want to give a passage in support of your suggestion about the Enoch uh, passage. In uh, if he is referencing the the book of Enoch, First Enoch, in Titus chapter one and verse twelve, when Paul quotes another one of those pagan poets, he calls him a prophet. It doesn't mean that he was affirming his inspiration, but he was using the term uh, and, you know, accommodatively. So it could be the same thing there in Jude. And then there's also, of course, I wonder if you could comment on the possibility of Jewish oral traditional histories as a source. Like in the Apostle Paul talks about things uh, from Jewish history that you can't read in the Old Testament. Stephen in his sermon, talks about things you can't read in the Old Testament. Some of them you'll find in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews. Was there a, a train of Jewish oral history of some of those old events that some of these people or multiple sources might be drawing from? It's possible that there is another uh, train of history, but we, we can't know very much about it. So Josephus, in his writings, refers to his, his reliance on another Jewish historian. I, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but he, there was another historical book written about most of what Josephus wrote about prior to uh, the fall of the, the Second Temple. However, we only know as much about it as Josephus said. No copies have, existed, have survived to today. So um, it is possible that there was even more than an oral history, but a written history of, Judea, of, of the, the nation of Israel and the patriarchs that existed perhaps long into the, the farthest reaches of history that, that just hasn't survived because it was not part of the biblical canon and it's not essential for our understanding of, of the history of God's people and our place in God's plan today. Um, I, I don't want to speculate too much on that uh, considering we're dealing with some details that aren't found in the canonical scriptures, but there were other historical sources available that may have had to do with this uh, this kind of phenomenon. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I know there are other questions to be asked and other things to be said. We do appreciate uh, what you've given us tonight. Um, do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make? Nothing in specific aside from a, a general thank you to, to all of you for being here. And thank you for your confidence in me. I know this is a, well, I know this is a daunting subject to deal with. <laughs> and, and I appreciate your confidence in me too work my way through it in front of you.